All right, good evening, friends. It is time, chapter one of The Mighty Miss Malone. Um, again, if you watched my video from earlier, I will read to you the first chapter. I will ask you some questions. I'm hoping to upload those questions for reading comprehension. Um, and then we will go over those answers tomorrow before we read chapter two. And ignore my friends Rosie and Stella in the background. They are still playing. All right, the mighty Miss Malone. In memory of three of my heroes, my uncle, George Taylor, Tuskegee Airman, Congressional Gold Medal winner, hero. My friend, Harrison Edward Patrick, hero. And my brother, Herman David Curtis, hero. That's sweet. Remember, some of you guys chose in your biography projects, um, sorry, not biography, your nonfiction expert topic projects to include a dedication page. Um, so that's kind of what the page is that I just read. All right, without further ado, get yourself a comfy, cuddly blanket, your favorite stuffed animal, comfy pillow, um, got your jammies on, kick back and relax, and let's listen to part one, late May, 1936, in Gary, Indiana, The Mighty Miss Malone. Chapter one, Journey to Wonderful. Once upon a time, if I could get away with it, that's how I begin every essay I wrote. Those are the four best words to use when you start telling about yourself because anything that begins that way always, always finishes with another four words. They lived happily ever after. And that's a good ending for any story. I shut my dictionary and thesaurus and went back over my essay for the last time. The best teacher in the world, Mrs. Karen Needham, had just given us an assignment to write down about our families. I knew, just like always, she was going to love mine. She'd only asked for two pages, but this was our last essay for the year. So I wrote six pages. Once upon a time in Gary, Indiana, lived a family of three very special very happy and uniquely talented people. I am the fourth member of that family, and much too modest to include myself in such a description of their exalted number. But many people say I am of the same ilk, and for that I remain internally grateful. My mother, Mrs. Margaret Peggy uh, Malone, was born here in Gary, Indiana. She is willowy and radiant, and sublimely beautiful. She is also very intelligent. She has a great job cleaning for the Cardsdale family. Yes, the, that Cardsdale family. The family whose patriarch is the president of the Gary Citizens Bank. Her most endearing trait is that she is the glue that is holding this family together. Daza, I jumped and my pencil flew out of my hand. When I'm writing or reading a book, everything else around me disappears. Father says it's because I've settled into what I'm doing, the same way my brother Jimmy does when he's singing. Jimmy, I told you not to sneak up on me like that when I'm writing. He handed me the pencil. I couldn't help his sis. You are so far gone. What are you writing? My last essay for Mrs. Needham. You know, a lot of people are saying her not coming back to teach is the best thing that ever happened at Lincoln Woods School. James Malone, if I ever give one half a hoot what a lot of people are saying, you have my permission to slap me silly. Mrs. Needham is the best teacher in the world. Now, if you don't mind, I never bother you when you're singing. Don't bother me when I'm writing. But lots of people love hearing me sing, does it? Seems to me like only you, that little pest, Clarice Ann Johnson, and Mrs. Needham like reading whatever you write. Jimmy is one of those people who can say something that might sound mean at first, but when he smiles and makes his eyebrows jump up and down, you can't help but smile. He gets this deep, deep dimple in his right cheek and you end up laughing right along with him. My dearest friend, 
Clarice Ann Johnson has a horrible and completely ununderstandable crush on Jimmy. She says she bets you could pour cornflakes in his dimple and eat them out with a spoon. Wow, that's uh, some imagery there. I'm hoping Clarice's taste in boys improves as she gets older. Jimmy, please. Sorry, sis, I'm heading out. Can I do anything for you before I split? No, thanks. Just make sure you're back for supper. I looked at Mrs. Needham's instructions again. What is the most annoying trait of some of your family members? That was easy to come up with for father and Jimmy, but I couldn't think of a single annoying trait for my mother. I wrote, Mother's pet peeve is that she hates the way a lot of people are mean to Jimmy for no reason. He dream her dreams are to see father get a job where he doesn't always get laid off. For Jimmy to start growing again and be happy to watch me graduate from college and be a teacher. My father, Mr. Roscoe Malone, was born in a village in Michigan called Flint which is geologically located 250 miles northwest of Gary. For some reason that none of us can understand, he is very proud of this. He is tall and strikingly handsome. He is also intelligent and well-read. He toils and labors mostly for the company, doing work in a horribly hot furnace, and sometimes being a janitor. Ooh, the dog's almost... Pulled my computer off of the table. I apologize for that. His most annoying trait is the way he uses alliteration every chance he has. And alliteration is when you use words that use the same beginning letter. So, um, like darling daughter Deza. Those all start with D. It's kind of like a tongue twister. That's what alliteration is. I looked up for my paper. That is so true, but I wondered for a minute. If I should put that in an essay, it isn't like he can help himself. He is always calling me his darling daughter, Deza, and I'm supposed to answer that he is my dearest, delightful dad. Alliteration. He calls Jimmy the genuine, gentle, jumping giant, and Jimmy's supposed to call him his fine, friendly father figure. Getting the hang of alliteration? <clears throat> Father also calls mother the marvelous uh, <laughs> mama matriarch, but she says she will not respond because she refuses to play silly word games with such a hard-headed husband who hasn't heard how horrible he is. <laughs> mother told me such nonsense is in the blood of the Malones, and you should be happy that so far it looks like you haven't inherited any of it. She says Jimmy is a different story. I tap the pencil on my teeth. I know it's rude and disloyal to discuss family business with the other people, but Mrs. Needham says good writing is always about telling the truth. Father's most endearing trait is that he is the best storyteller and poet in the world. He can come up with a poem at the most inappropriate times. His pet peeve is that even though he's smart, it's very hard for him to find a job. His dream is to do what he was trained to do in Flint, be a carpenter. The oldest child in our family, Mr. James Edward Malone, is 15 years old and has been blessed with the singing voice of an angel. Jimmy's most annoying trait is that he has what Mother says is a Napoleon complex. That means that Jimmy is not as tall or robust as most boys his age, and he tries to make up for it by being as loud and as full of braggadocio. I'll have to look up that word, as he can. He also gets in lots of fight, fights. Jimmy's most endearing trait is that he loves me more than any big brother has ever loved a little sister since the beginning of time. That's sweet. Um, I'm going to assume that that big word that even Mrs. Keller doesn't know means that he um, acts tougher than maybe he really is. Um, Jimmy is the best big brother in the world. Ooh, some alliteration there. 
On my last birthday, we had just finished eating and I could barely sit still because after supper, the birthday person gets something special. It was my turn to clear the dishes and I stalled around in the kitchen to give them lots of time to get my surprise ready, then walked back into the dining room. There were two cupcakes with a candle in the middle of them sitting at my and Jimmy's spots, a chocolate frosted one for me and a vanilla frosted one for Jimmy. I was speechless. Jimmy said, wow, Ma, these are store-bought. Mother must have been putting pennies aside for a long time to buy two such beautiful little cakes. Father said, James, please do the honors. Jimmy closed his eyes and settled into singing, happy birthday. I got chills, girls. <laughs> You're making the table move. <laughs> Sorry, guys. Um, sorry about that. I got chills. I wasn't sure if it was because Jimmy's voice or because mother and father joined in on the last chorus. When they were done, I smiled so hard. It felt like my cheekbones were crushing my eyeballs. Aww. Jimmy said, I got you two gifts. One, I'll wash and dry the dishes for a week. And two, he looked at father and they walked into the other room. When they came back, each one of them was carrying a heavy package wrapped in newspapers. Uh, they set them down in front of me. I said, Flint style or Gary style? Father always tells us mother opens packages and envelopes Gary style. He says, we Gary people pry and poke and pull the envelope so carefully and daintily and take so long doing it that we might as well be doing brain surgery. He says we do it that way because Indiana people are so cheap that we want to use the same envelope over and over. That's a good idea. Word has it, he said, once that there have been only two envelopes used in the whole state of Indiana since the War of 1812. Do you think that's true? Hmm. Then he showed us what he called opening something flint style. It was a race to see how quick you could get what was inside the envelope or package out. To be officially flint style, Father says, the envelope or wrapping paper has to be shredded into at least six different pieces. It's got to look like confetti. That's kind of how I open my mail. I get excited about letters. Um, I glanced at mother. She shook her head and said, I suppose you can't fight the fact that half of your blood is from Flint. I tore into the newspaper on the first present and I was shocked. It was old and tired and I had used it a million times before. How did Jimmy get this? Jimmy said, the library was selling books they didn't want anymore. Here's the receipt for these two I bought for you. He handed me a piece of paper. He'd paid three cents for a dictionary and two cents for a thesaurus. Inside the first page of the dictionary, someone had stamped in red ink, withdrawn. Jim, Jimmy had written underneath that, February 14th, 1935, happy 12th birthday, sis. The dictionary and thesaurus are the best birthday presents I will ever get. The best birthday presents, too. Oh, the best birthday presents, too. She was making fun of how he misspelled the word. I looked back over my essay. Jimmy's pet peeve is when people call him shorty, little fella, or worst of all, peewee. His dream is to start growing again until he is six foot tall. A six foot tall man who is covered with bumpy muscles. That reminds me of Michael Jordan. Do you remember that story? Maybe his mom needs to put salt in his shoes. Jimmy's other dream is to be the first boy to drive a rocket ship to the moon. He is very delusional. Unfortunately, this video is coming up on 15 minutes, and uh, YouTube will only allow me to upload 15 minutes at a time. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to stop this video here, and then I've got just about three pages left to read for you in Chapter 1, and then I'll go over the questions with you um, in the next video. All right? Thank you. See you in a bit.